Just everything else seems to be going okay. So we're ready to start. So uh, first of all, we're going to have. Uh, I'm going to change the agenda as is my prerogative, and after. Item seven, we're going to go to confidential and look at items 11, 12, and 13. So hopefully we get all the items that are for decision making covered first. Sorry, correction, that's after item six, we'll be going to items 11, 12, and 13. So uh, that's for your information. Uh, so go to item one, which is apologies. I have an emailed apology from Councillor Dr. Josephine Deegan, who won't be here tonight. Uh, I'm now going to go to Councillor Tommy Maguire. I go to Margaret Kearley to Kearfer, this guilty own group of him, Fianna and Oct. We have four apologies today. Uh, Councillor Stephen McCann, Councillor Seamus Green, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly, and Councillor Anthony Feely. Go to Margaret. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tommy. Next, we go to Councillor Victor Warrington, Ulster Unionist. Councillors. Um, Rainey and Martin. Thank you, Victor. Next, we go to Councillor Paul Robinson of the DUP. Paul, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. No apologies, Councillor Elliott. We're a bit late. Thank you, Paul. And I'm just looking to see is Councillor Mary Garty online? Yeah, here, Chair. Thanks, okay. John. Um, no apologies from our grouping tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mary. We've already got an apology from Councillor Deegan, and I know Eamon's online. Are you aware of any others from the uh, the independents and single party representatives? I'm not seeing any indication, so I'm assuming Josephine's the only one we're apologizing at this stage. Next, we go to item two, which is to sign the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 2nd of November. And I've already done that. And now we go to item three, which is declarations of interest. And Councillor Emmett McAleer on WebEx. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, there's one item. Uh, under agenda item 6.1, it relates to item 2.2, the Enniskillen Workhouse, just as a Southwest College employee. But I do, uh, there, there are a number of items in that Estates Matters report that I do intend to speak on, but I'll be uh, sort of declaring an interest in relation to that particular item on the agenda item 6.1. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emmett. And not seeing anybody else indicating in the chamber or online. So next we go to uh, matters arising, and that's from the meeting on the 2nd of November. Just go through that page by page. So page one, page two, page three, page four, page five. Page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, and page ten. Okay, not seeing anybody indicating, so we're going to move on. So next we go to Agenda item 5.1, which is uh, our st street naming and numbering dual language policy. And we go to Officer John Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, this is the uh, report which has now become a standard report effectively in bringing uh, streets and road names for the, the dual language um, uh, approval. Um, and uh, it is in accordance with our street road and name and number and policy and should including dual language of 2021. Uh, you will see members in table one, the list of names which have been considered in, in this month uh, for dual language. Um, 
you will see, I suppose, the, the extensive work that is involved in a in no, number of these. Probably for the first time, the numbers of occupiers who are listed on the electoral register in some of these roads is very extensive. Like you will see, for example, the Crocknaboy Road 329, Loch McCrory Road 268 occupiers on, on the electoral register, Drumna Road 322, and so on. Uh, so I have to say, from, from an officer's point of view, uh, quite a sizable amount of work in, first of all, with the electoral office uh, and secondly, in communication out to the occupiers who are listed on the electoral register. Uh, table one uh, gives an indication of uh, the, the occupiers, uh, whether they met the, the conditions as set out uh, by our policy. And in all uh, instances, uh, each one of them met, uh, met the criteria of 15%. Uh, I suppose in, in, uh, in line with, with the policy, uh, there is that the that, uh, residual discretion uh, as uh, included in the policy at, at Annex C um, for the Council to retain that residual discretion and, and protection uh, for to erect or not to erect uh, the signage. Uh, table 2 uh, outlines the Irish uh, spelling of those names um, and uh, section three of the report indicates uh, the cost uh, that is associated with it. You will see there in table three, uh, again, in the, an indication of the size of the, the length of the roads, for example, the, the Crocknaboy Road, the Drum, Drum Achille Road, the, the, the number of signs that are required to be erected in, in each of those instances, coming to approximately £60,000 uh, for the cost of signage. Um, so therefore, Chair, uh, the recommendation is that the Council approves the installation of the dual language signage for the streets and roads uh, listed in 2.7 of the report in accordance with, uh, with the street and road naming and numbering policy of 2021. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Um, as you said, uh, we, we've been here now, this is, this is monthly. Uh, we do, the only reason we we have is the residual discretion. Uh, so I'm going to go first of all to Councillor Tommy Maguire. Mr. Maguire, thank you, Chair. I was just uh, coming in to, to uh, propose the recommendation. But uh, just if I could, uh, just in a, a response to John's uh, advice there about the, 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 how difficult and the, the, how onerous the task is. Uh, is that a statutory obligation, John, that we have to go through that rather onerous route to, to achieve the, the, the change in the names? It's not something that's within the gift of the council to change the procedure. Uh, I'm also aware that uh, uh, an issue was raised about the changing of names on a, a street across our district. And the, I think the instruction was that that's something we cannot do within the council. Is that uh, instruction, is it coming from a higher level or what? how could we change that? Is there any way we could reduce the burden of, of work involved, Chair, please? Uh, Chair, ju just in relation to the burden of work, I suppose in order to get the views of each one of the, of the residents or of the occupiers of the street or the road, it is important to get their views and to seek their views because that is the basis on which we have we have the policy. Uh, and I suppose the only formal uh, list of occupiers is through the electoral register. So the only the only accurate way of of doing it is actually to go to the electoral office and 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 to to get those list of names and and as I've explained before in previous months that is quite an onerous task especially when you're dealing with hundreds of of occupiers on on a road or a street. Thank you, John. Next, we go to Councillor Victor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Well, I appreciate uh, as has been stated that this is policy. Uh, and therefore, uh, but we will still be voting against it. Um, I'm just looking at the, the capital budget there of 200,000, uh, and in one month, uh, there's been 59,850 pounds. Like that's over over 25% of it. Uh, so it's the 200,000, I'm not sure what is spent out of that already. There's quite, there's obviously quite a chunk of that gone already. Uh, so, Obviously, when we hit that, when we hit that level of two hundred thousand, um, everything ceases, or until uh, the start of of the new mandate again, which obviously we'll see see where we're going from there. 
Yeah, uh, Chair, I suppose in relation to the expenditure, I think we're sitting at around £140,000-£150,000, which we have approved through Council at this stage. That is not to say that we have spent that amount of money. That's the amount that we have got approval for. There is a process then to go on and to order the signs and to erect the signs and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we probably have one more report or maybe a little more than one more report, depending again on the number of occupiers on the street, in order to get approval for. That's not to say that we won't bring further approvals through in order to have them sitting there pending uh, est the estimates process for the next financial year. Thank you, John. Next, we go to Councillor Paul Robinson. Chair, the DUP are voting against this this policy, but I'm not kind of money in road signs. And I think the money can be used for something else. So, if we're going to vote, and it would like a recorded vote. Thank you. That's noted. Next, we go to Councillor Robert Irvine. Yeah, it's just basically on the back of what Councillor Warrington said, John. It would be useful. I know, I think I requested several months ago um, on table two, basically, the approximate cost per road. So that's done. There's no problem at all. But I think because we have a capital budget, it would be useful, I think. Um, it doesn't really say in the financial provisions the countdown, really, of what's, what's done. So if you go back a month or two, maybe when they're, when they're installed and you know the finished cost, if that could be roughly factored in so we actually see a running total because um this month because of two roads well three roads essentially having numerous junctions the amount of signage and we, we did talk about this before um puts the cost uh, inordinately high but that that's what it is uh, that's what it is but we need to basically then see where we're going because i wouldn't like to get if we have another four or five months in this mandate going forward that you process uh, a lot of roads and you're actually inadvertently running over the capital expenditure that's been granted you know the limit of it so rather than get to that it would be useful if we had sort of a a running idea of what's going on thanks very much uh, chair i think what we can do is, is provide details of uh, the amount that we have got approval for and the amount that has also been expended. And now the amount that has been expended, most of it, most of that expenditure will be taking place in the last quarter of the year because of the lead-in time for roads and so on and so forth. Um, so, but we can we can provide both both of those sets of data in, in for the future report. Okay, thank you, John. And next we go on to Webex and with Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it always kind of amazes me and astounds me how long uh, I spent discussing this particular topic when it comes up at the monthly meetings. Um, I said in your introduction, this is something that has already been agreed and as again as noted within the the report presented to us on, on item 3.1.3, there's a capital budget of £200,000 approved within the budgets for installation of dual language signage. So I don't see what the issue is here. I don't understand what the objection is. When the people who live on these roads haven't objected, um, I note there's only one really out of all the roads presented to us tonight, there's a a number, a percentage there, 10% on the Taddy Ray Road. Other than that, it's ab absolutely negligible, the opposition to this. So I, I don't know where the councillors that have spoken up, uh, where they actually get off and telling the people who don't even live within their DEA what they should and shouldn't be doing in terms of the representation around their areas. So I'm happy enough to second the noting of the proposal of the report and proceeding with it. And I think we should uh, proceed on to the next item. So I would propose that we do that. Uh, if we're going to have a vote, we get the vote done and we move on to the next item. As you said, there's a lengthy agenda here. So there's no point wasting time on this matter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emmett. Uh, Councillor Stephen Donnelly, and this is around uh, some of the mitigating circumstances. Uh, keep it brief. No, that's no worries, Chair. I, I do just want to come on uh, on this point because I, I don't usually comment to this item, but I think this because this is a, a, a recurring issue, I think that it is point uh, worth just putting on the record. I mean, I... I'm someone, I'll be straight up, I mean, I'm someone who believes that it is right that we do have proactive, encouraging measures uh, to help 
uh, improve the visibility of the Irish language, which is an important part. Hi, right, Stephen. This this is this has been debated. It can only and be yeah, the ideal. I mean, I appreciate just being allowed to make my, my, my one contribution on this item, Chair. The point is, I mean, like, even if you don't accept that particular policy, the fact is we've got two roads, you know, on this list tonight that have got substantial majorities in, in favour of moving ahead with this. So it's not just the case of voting against um, areas that actually want, uh, it's, it's not just a, a case of voting against areas that have got minor opposition. We're talking about areas where there are substantial majorities in favour. And I just don't understand the democracy argument when it comes to that. So I'll just leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Next, we go to uh, Councillor Alex Baird in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Again, to... Alex, I'm going to caution you. Unless it's to cover the residual, it's... It, 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 it's in relation to a comment already, two comments already made, by uh, one by Councillor McAleer about uh, issues being brought up. Every meeting, there's a herd of hobby horses brought up, and the same herd come along time after time. Why is it? Why is it? Why? Sorry, don't interrupt. Chair, would you remind the interrupter that there's a standing order of when people are speaking, they're not to be interrupted. Now, I'll come to an agreement with him. I'll not interrupt him when he's talking rubbish. So if he doesn't interrupt me when I'm speaking. How you, dare you? What rubbish? What rubbish? How Sorry. dare you? I'm a... Withdraw that remark, Councillor. I'd request that you withdraw that remark, Councillor, through the chair. That's outrageous. Next, we go to Councillor Adam Gallon, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'll not get involved in, in that back and forth, uh, thankfully. Um, just a, a query around this, Chair, and maybe the directors can't answer it now, or maybe they'll bring it in the report next month. But a number of, and, and I will be supporting this policy, uh, obviously, and the introduction of these signs, but uh, a number of councillors said they're going to be voting against council policy. What would happen in a situation that this chamber voted against implementing its own policy? What would be the stand in there? Just so councillors, especially those voting against policy, would, would know what they're potentially, if there is a risk, if there's any uh, reg uh, regards to that. But if you can't give that tonight, maybe another point. Thank you. No, Chair, just, just in relation to voting against it, I suppose there is an allowance within the policy for the residual discretion. The final residual discretion is left to members. Yeah, and that was very clearly written in and was explained at the time of, of bringing the policy forward. So effectively, they're not voting against policy. They're, they're, they're voting against the recommendation, which is here in order to install. Okay, thank you, John. That makes that very clear. Finally, we're going to Councillor Ari McElduff. Just to check, Chair. Okay, look, if recommendation has been seconded. Yes, Councillor McAleer seconded. Okay. Thank you. Don't need Thank to do you. it then. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Earl Thompson, again, Earl, the only reason you can come in is for a residual, not for... Chair, uh, if you allow me, because uh, I think I, I do need to come back to Councillor McAleer. Uh, we, we as a party are entitled to our decisions. And we will make those decisions without him trying to browbeat yeah. us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Earl. And finally, Councillor Potter and Kelly. Thanks, Chair. I am at a loss as to how this argument comes up every single environmental services meeting. And to be honest, I don't think it's good enough. There are things that go through here that are council policy, and we are following that legitimately. So. I don't understand how this party can call themselves democratic and they don't understand the democratic process of this council. Thanks. Okay, right. There's a, obviously we're going to a vote, so if we can set up a vote, please, and that's to go with the officer's recommendations.
Okay, so that's 16 for, 10 against, so the policy is, uh, the, the paper is going to be adopted as recommended. Okay, so now we move on to item 5.2. Again, we we'll go to Officer John Boyle. Uh, this was debated, but we didn't make a decision at the last meeting. So John has updated the document based on the arguments that were presented by councillors. So I believe tonight may be just more for information, although we do have to make a decision. But this is an updated document from the last meeting, so we may not need as much discussion on this. Thank you, Chair. Yes, as, as you said, Chair, um, was discussed in, in some detail last month, although time didn't allow us to make, to make a decision in relation to it. Maybe I, I, I think we had went through it in quite good detail last month. I'll just highlight the, the elements which have changed in, in this report. You'll see at 2.1.5 uh, since the previous report in, in last month, the Dogs Trust have now agreed to cover all the vets, the vets costs for any dogs which the Council may transfer to them for onward rehoming. Um, and that is a change uh, from, what, from where we were last month. Um, also at 2.1.6, we had last month said that we would, that we would probably recommend that we wouldn't take any uh, unwanted dogs um, rather than stray dogs. Uh, just in, in light of the, the discussions which were which took place at, at last month's um, uh, committee meeting, uh, what we have said in 2.116 is that the dog wardens will work with dog owners uh, uh, to uh, and, and the charities on rehoming options. So we will get more involved where where a dog owner comes to comes to the council officer and and looks for us to take the rehoming. We will we will work with the dog charities to try and make sure that the the charity takes that dog and and that the that the, the owner works directly with the charity, um, and and where where. All of those avenues have been have been exhausted, and there is no room or whatever in 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 the charity. Yeah, we will continue to to take the unwanted dogs, but we will review this on an ongoing basis in in the new year. Historically, over the Christmas period, we don't normally uh, because of of the the activity uh, in relation to uh, unwanted dogs or whatever. We normally do not take unwanted dogs over the Christmas period anyway. So this will not this will not have a major impact on it. Uh, in section two point two, um, we we had talked about the the uh, about re about the future options for uh, for the dog pound itself. Uh, and we, that recommendation has not changed in, in relation to uh, that we will continue to provide that service. Uh, and indeed, in section 2.3, the update on, on recent dog uh, control attacks uh, have, have, not, have not changed either. Can I just point out that section 2.4 about buying a puppy for Christmas, we have added in an additional section in there. Um, and yes, we, we certainly we certainly advise that that residents and that uh, owners of dogs, um, you know, view our, our council website guidance on on uh, on the issue. Um, in relation to uh, members of the public coming to our dog pound and looking for in order to to take a dog home, that is not something I suppose that we would encourage. Um, and and mainly the mainly the the purpose the reason why we wouldn't is that there are quite stringent uh, rules with regard to if we were to give out a dog or if a charity were to give out a dog, there, there are uh, important tasks that have to be taken. In fact, you know, they have to visit the, that home before, before they give out the dog to make sure it's going to a suitable home, that there is proper, proper safety, that there is an element of, of the ability to look after the dog and so on and so forth. That would be quite strenuous in relation to officer time. Uh, and it is not something that we would normally do. Uh, we would encourage uh, residents who are looking for a dog to, to go to uh, the charity or whatever, and, and those activities would be carried out there. So, Chair, just in, in conclusion on the recommendation, it's recommended that the Council approves to continue, or approves to continue to operate the dog kennel facility in-house uh, using Council staff, notes the continuation of collecting and housing stray dogs and where necessary unwanted dogs uh, and any associated veterinary and care costs, notes the recent prosecution case outcomes, notes the, the Christmas puppy campaign and notes the inability of the dog control service to operate an in-house rehoming service at this time. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you, John, for that there. I think that uh, covers a lot of what was discussed the last time. I'm going to go first of all to Councillor Victor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, I asked how uh, many, uh, many dogs is actually rehomed from, from, or even a rough number of what was rehomed from the actual the dog pound. Um, just as moving forward, and I'm just going by some some of the, I think it's some of the actual border uh, border um, councils in 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 Southern Ireland uh, actually have put up quite a comprehensive uh, advertisement on Facebook. You know, with the dogs that they have, and you know, even down to as far as naming them and showing pictures of them uh, to encourage. To encourage people to obviously take them, uh, is that something we could look at doing? And also, you're talking about um, having to vet people before they they basically take a dog. I know certainly having adopted dogs in the past from even the dogs trust in Balamina, uh, they were happy enough with uh, a letter uh, from a local vet. Um, so don't know if that's something again that would 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 leave the would leave it easier. So, the chair. Thank you, Victor. I suppose in in, in relation to re, the rehoming issue, um, you know, in order to ensure that a dog is going to a good home, um, there is a there is a requirement uh, to undertake the home visits, and and that is as a public body, we would be responsible for that. Now, I don't know if that if that legislation or, or if that those rules are in place in in Southern Ireland to the to the same extent, uh, but certainly, I suppose with the, with the level of staffing that we would have, we would not be able to undertake that exercise at this point in time. Uh, our our time is actually spent in in looking after the dogs in the dog pound, but also out there with stray and unwanted dogs, and then de dealing with all different aspects of of uh, dog attacks and, and so on and so forth. So it's not something that we would at this stage in, encourage that we would get involved in. Hey John, next we go to Councillor Robert Irving. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, John, um, I'm happy enough with the recommendations apart from 8.2. Um, you've referred to it, I think, in 2.3, 2.2, sorry. And in your verbal update, you've said that you'll actually review, yeah, 2.1.6, you will review the operation in the new year. Um, because we are not working on full cost recovery here. And you have mentioned the last time, and that's why uh, I'm not happy with this, in that our pound is probably working on a full capacity and you're trying to turn over, and that's really stray dogs. Unwanted dogs are a totally different situation. They're coming from somebody who actually specifically wanted a dog, and then for whatever reason, they want it handed on. So they want to obligate the responsibility from themselves onto us. I think in the current stringent times that we're in, we have to be a little bit uh, hard-nosed in this. So if I'm going to go with that recommendation, I would like to see a caveat in on 8.2, that this will be reviewed uh, in the new year with a view to considering full cost recovery for unwanted dogs. And if that amendment was put in at 8.2, I'm happy to propose the recommendations in their entirety. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It, it is something actually that as officers we have discussed, and actually it was in the report at one stage about full cost recovery. Um, it is something that we that we in and as was in in light of um the financial constraints that are affecting the community out there is something that we took out certainly it is something that we can we can certainly add on if that is the council's which wish um to add on that we will also review full cost recovery and bring a report back in the new year if, if that if that's what council decides certainly yes thank you um councillor Podrick and Kelly, your hand, is that still up from before or were you up for this one here as well? Uh, I'm assuming you're not, Podrick. So I'm going to go to Councillor Benice Swift on Webex. 
Yeah, Garamagat, uh, Kahirluk, and thank John and all the staff for this amended report. It's great, and I'm so satisfied about the uh, welfare of the dogs in this instance and all of the proposals under the recommendation. And I'm uh, content to propose the recommendation with the inclusion of Councillor Irvine's amendment. I think that's very sensible and practical to review early in the ne in the new year. So thanks again, John, for all of that. Garamagat. Thank you, Bernice. Next, we go to Councillor Diane Armstrong in the chamber. Chair, just coming in a little late um, on this um, to say that it what, what concerns me, and I'm just going to propose that we keep a watching brief on the strays because we're coming into time of lambing, and I'm just worried that the attacks on livestock may escalate. Um, if that does become a problem, will we be able to consider that um, for stray if there's increased numbers of stray, stray dogs? in the district. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Go yeah, to yeah. the officer again. Chair, yes, it was strays is, is our number one concern. Uh, and that's why it was our initial uh, proposal was to, was to accept strays uh, and to deal with strays and, and not to not to consider uh, unwanted dogs at this stage. So strays continue to be our number one priority just for, for that purposes. But I would imagine, and I suppose this is a this is a throwback to, to COVID. Uh, where you know a, a number of of, of uh, households got dogs at that time, um, and I think what we are seeing now is the outworkings of, of that. So yeah, it is likely that strays will will be will become a bigger issue as we move ahead. And in fact, if if you see uh, table one at, at section two point one point three, you will see the massive increase in the number of strays that is already uh, in our district. Seventy seven from the, the stray dogs dealt with in the period first of April twenty one to the thirtieth of September twenty one, compared to one hundred and ninety seven. In, in the same period in, in 2022. So we're already seeing the outworkings of that. Thank you, John. Next we go to Councillor Adam Gannon in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. I think Councillor Irvine's addition is uh, very sensible. Um, just a question around uh, 215 there and, and the Dogs Trust have come in, which is, which is new information. <clears throat> uh, how many dogs can we transfer onto them? Because I think it was a concern that was raised, and I know I had mentioned it in November, about um, simply taking in dogs just to put them down because we can't rehome them, um, which is just which is dreadful to say, but I think it's a reality of, of the situation that it happens. How many can we send on to dogs trust to see of that 85 that we took in in the past year from April 21 to March 22? Um, how many could we, in theory, send on? And I think in a review, it might be worthwhile um, to include how many unwanted dogs we do have to, to put down when that review comes. What percentage can we rehome? I would hope be hopeful that it's a high percentage we can rehome. Um, but I think it's good to have the full information there as well. Chair, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I don't have that information available at this point in time about the number that we send to charities for rehoming. Certainly something that we will provide in the report in the new year as to the number that we uh, uh, that we rehome um, and how many we put down. So, yeah, certainly we, we can provide that information. Thank you, John. Next, we go to Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald on WebEx. Yes, um, thanks, Chair. Just on something that Victor had come up. Um, just the number of stray dogs and unwanted dogs that people is is actually um, not wanting at the minute, and it will be going up as we all know because of the climate that we're in at the minute. Just um, I know still know people who are very interested and in looking to get to get um, an unwanted or to get a dog to be rehomed, but do you know what? Um, people who are working they really can't go to Ballymena. They don't want to go to Monaghan, which it seems to be, as, as Victor had said, the ones um, cross border. Like they have very good um, social media up, dogs' names, dog pictures, but they're like, you know, who'd be the best with that? You know, um, I think it's unfair that um, we're actually shipping these dogs away when there's so many people locally that I definitely know would want them. They don't really want a puppy um, because of the puppy farms. Some of them do, but you know what? If they see something smaller, and I think here in the north, we're more inclined to take the smaller dogs. Smaller household dogs, I think, was in one of our previous meetings, and um, over in England, Scotland, and Wales, they're more inclined to have a bigger dog. So, 
maybe it's a bit more work with the with the with the animal trust to see if we can get a bit more social media down around this end and hopefully maybe that um get get our ordinary folks who want who still want dogs on board on this. Thank you, Amory. Yeah, uh, Chair, we, we, we do currently work with all animal charities um, in order for rehoming of, of, of dogs and, and for many other issues in, in, in relation to dogs. We will continue to do that. And I think as, as outlined in the report, we will double those efforts uh, in working along with those charities um, uh, and the dog owners themselves in, in order to try and get rehoming options for, for, for the owners of, of those dogs. So it's some, something that we will refresh and, and we will we'll, we'll take a, a, a more increased um, part in, in working with those charities in order to get rehoming for, for suitable dogs. Thank you, John. I'm not seeing anybody else indicating. I'm getting a general consensus that uh, we're going to go with the recommendations as amended by Councillor Irvine. Um, is there anybody contrary to that? Not seen any case, and so we'll assume that's uh, adopted. So we'll put. Can I move on to item 6.1, and that's in the state matters? I'm going to go to Director John News. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the uh, monthly estate matters uh, report. A uh, number of issues for decisions set out in Section 2, and a number of issues just for information uh, in Section 3 of the report. Uh, it's taken through each of those. Uh, 2.1 deals with uh, a request to uh, vary a boundary uh, on lands that are leased at uh, Lisnaric playing fields in Lisnaric to Lisnaric Football Club. Uh, and the recommendation is that uh, that uh, variation in the, the leased lands would be approved. A uh, uh, <coughs> recommendation to enter into a temporary license agreement uh, retrospective to the 1st of December for Enniskillen Workhouse uh, with Southwest College. Uh, there's ongoing uh, work with LPS to uh, determine the uh, the value of the, the how the, the joint funding arrangements will operate between the council and the college. So it's a retrospective approval sought in respect of that particular uh, temporary licence agreement. Uh, 2.3 uh, Locker and Landscape Partnership uh, has received some grant aid for a project uh, to celebrate uh, nature and the special birds of Loch Arne and has requested permission to install uh, a mural, a double sided mural at the Round Owen in Eskillen. And a recommendation that uh, permission will be granted for that, subject to the identification of a suitable site uh, or location at the Round O and obviously compliance with any of the not necessary statutory approvals. Uh, 2.4, then a request from uh, Omis and Endes GFC uh, to use uh, the car park at Greenhill Cemetery as overspill uh, parking. And again, a recommendation that a uh, temporary legal agreement would be drawn up to reflect those arrangements. Uh, and just worth noting that that's a similar arrangement had operated last year and operated successfully. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, 2.5, then uh, it's a, a, a recommendation for uh, a, a a lease agreement uh, for a telecoms mast in the uh, upper green uh, car for upper fir green car park in Liston Ski. Uh, there was a, a retrospective element to this uh, when the the car park transferred to council in in 2015. It transpired that the uh, Department for Regional Development didn't have a legal agreement in place with uh, EE as the provider of the telecoms mast. So there has been uh, protracted negotiations with the agents for EE and with LPS uh, to secure uh, the best possible settlement for the council. And it's recommended now, uh, LPS have recommended uh, a settlement uh, retrospectively of £10,600 uh, and then further recommended that to regularise uh, the lease that would uh, regularise the arrangements that we enter into a 10 year lease with EA in respect of the mast uh, at a rental of £1,000 per annum and that would be subject to a five year rent review. Uh, at 2.6, then uh, following a, an expressions of interest uh, process for the provision of CAFE services OMA, OMA Leisure Complex, uh, we've received a, a submission for an annual fee of £1,800 in year one and £3,600 in year two, and that has been accepted and it's recommended that a legal agreement is entered into with the successful bidder for a two-year period. Uh, 2.7, uh, in October's uh, meeting, uh, members had asked that SGN uh, that those additional assurances provided in respect to the health and safety aspects of the proposed installation and operation of two underground district governors in Castle Street Car Park, Oma. 
uh, that we've had cor further correspondence from SGN setting out in Appendix 2 of the report, which uh, where SGN have set out the regulatory uh, uh, framework that they operate within and the compliance arrangements that, that currently exist in inspections uh, and controls within uh, from DFE. And on, this, on the basis of that, it's further recommended that we enter into an appropriate legal agreement with SGN in respect of those works. And that will obviously be subject to an assessment of uh, suitable compensation from LPS uh, and the uh, payment of council's uh, reasonable legal uh, and agent fees. Uh, 2.8. Then there's a request for retrospective approval of use of council property at Strew Arts Centre, uh, and that was uh, New Ireland TV. Uh, we're carrying out some film, filming at Strew Arts Centre uh, as part of the End of the West Real campaign, and uh, two yet two uh, outdoor recreation Northern Ireland requested permission to carry out photography in uh, Gorch and Glen's Forest Park on Saturday the 3rd of December for promotional marketing purposes, and the council have access to those. Uh, moving on to section three, then three point one is uh, set up for information. Uh, last month's meeting, members had requested that uh, we write the LPS to confirm that, as part of its assessment of the uh, market rental uh, income, the, uh, they had taken into account uh, community benefits that be derived from the proposals and also uh, the costs that would be avoided uh, by, by for council uh, in terms of the, the lease of the lands to uh, the friends of Loch McCrory. Uh, LPS have written back and confirmed that uh, the, their assessment of the, the annual market value is 4,600 and they have advised that uh, it's up to the council uh, as to whether or not would wish to proceed with a nominal uh, rental uh, income as was discussed previously. Uh, for council to proceed with that nominal income, uh, there is a process which is uh, set out within the Local Government Act 1972 uh, that requires uh, ministerial approval uh, through the Department for Communities. And as previously advised to members in, in November, uh, the department have uh, once again confirmed to us that uh, while they can uh, take submissions for uh, at least below that uh, best market value, uh, they can't. Uh, there is no arrangement in place to take that decision in the absence of a minister. Uh, and I say that's unless there's uh, some further delegation of decision making powers to the permanent secretary. Uh, and finally, section uh, three point two is uh, to note the uh, the use of council premises at Oma Mart, and then also the sealing of documents. So the uh, financial implications are, are set out within section 4.1, and then the, the recommendations are set out in uh, section uh, 9.1, uh, 1 through to 8 for approval, and uh, 9.2, 9 through to 11 uh, to note. Uh, happy to take any questions, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, John. And first we go to Councillor Barry McLough. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd be happy to note uh, sorry, to propose the adoption of the recommendations. A um, couple of ones of particular interest to me. One would be uh, just to comment on the Enniskillen Workhouse, which uh, I was able to visit the other day, just to say the finish of that building uh, is second to none. It's just an observation, that's all. And I'm sure everybody will get visiting it uh, soon. But it's uh, the most fantastic finish of a property. Um, Secondly, then, um, I just want to commend Omis and Endes on the way they do their business. You know, that winter wonderland that they have in place there is fantastic. And anything that we can do to accommodate them, uh, as is outlined in the report, um, obviously we should cooperate with them. And even if that means entering into a temporary legal arrangement, you know, for, for that purpose, um, maybe just one question, uh, and the question would be, um, where do we stand on the extension of the Riverside Walk in Oma into the Grange Park? Um, you know, this has been agreed considerable time ago. Uh, it might involve representatives of Thrumra Parish, and perhaps Oma St Endes in relation to St Pat's Park. But um, you know, the extension of the Riverside Walk in Oma into the Grange uh, will be a very, very uh, positive thing when it is when it is concluded. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Go back to John here. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just in respect of the, uh, the the last point, the extension of the Riverside Walk is part of a, an overall Grange Master Plan. We are continuing to engage uh, with the, the landowner in this case. Uh, it's uh, the parish, and uh, we are, there's there's ongoing engagement there in that regard. Okay. Thank you, John. Next, we we'll go to Councillor Roy Crawford in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to uh, second Councillor Michael Duff. Uh, just to pick up on 2.3 and the round O, uh, I'm fully supportive of uh, the idea around the, uh, the mural. Is there any way we could maybe see what it actually looks like, a graphic of it? Is that uh, possible as a request? Or is it approved? Yeah, thank you, right. Certainly, well, the the, uh, the the approval or, or the recommendation is that it would be uh, permission to install, but it can be subject to the identification of a suitable site and the statutory compliances. And I'm, I'm sure, in terms of bringing the the final decision back, you know, we can ask for a copy of the the, the graphic uh, on both sides of the mural. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Thank you, John. Next, we go to Councillor Emmett McAleer on uh, Webex. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, John, for the report. As I said. I'm not going to speak on the the workhouse project due to my links with the Southwest College, but I do have a number of other issues to raise. Um, in relation to 2.5, and it's a related matter, Chair, so hopefully you'll give me leeway in, in bringing this, but we're talking about um, mobile phone provision. And within the last week or so, I've been contacted by a number of people in the Omi area around Colmore, Lamy and Brookmount, uh, who have noticed a significant drop in O2. Uh, provision around that area so I'm proposing or, or querying maybe as a council can we contact O2 to see if there's anything in relation to that which is affecting coverage in that particular area and um, because just for families keeping in contact and that uh, over the the colder weather in the winter months I think that's hugely important issue um, and a number of people have also been querying about uh, the, this issue of 5G again and the last update I got from the chief executive was that there were no 5G masts across the FODC area. Just wondering if we could again get a, an update on that. Um, item 2.6 I suppose in relation to the leisure complex. I, I'm wondering just why we're entering into a third party arrangement in relation, in relation to the service and why it's not something that staff employed by the council could provide. So maybe I could get a wee bit of clarity on that. Item 2.7, I think this is the main one. What the request the it's noted in the report that as requested by members at the October committee meeting, SGN has now provided an assurance regarding health and safety aspects of the proposed installation. The actual proposal from October, and I know because I made it and I believe Councillor Coffey seconded it, was that officers would endeavour to seek independent clarification regarding the safety implications of the proposed works. Now a letter from the actual provider doesn't strike me as anything like what we had actually requested. Um, I'm unsure where the confusion has come from. And again, I suppose much similar to the letter from Flintridge last night, this bland PR letter from SGN gives me no reassurance about health and safety aspects of the proposed two installations at the Castle Street car park uh, next to the Holy Family Primary School to control gas pressure to Oma Town properties. And indeed, given the recent disaster in Creeslock, it's important that we don't rubber stamp projects which are exempt from normal planning assessment procedures. It's essential that we apply the precautionary principle in this instance, and therefore I would propose that we actually refuse to approve this application at this time. In relation to 2.8.1, I would propose that Council invest, investigate hosting an informal meeting with the Into the West Real, group, Real Campaign Group. I think that would be hugely beneficial following on from the local meetings that they've held in Oma and elsewhere. And finally, just in relation to 3.1 and the, the lands at uh, in Loch McCrory, just I'm wondering, can we proceed with an agreement on a nominal fee due to, as noted, the perceived community need and business objectives in this case, I suppose, being mindful of the potential clawback at a future stage? Um, if it's out with the remit of local government, is there a minister within central government that can be contacted in relation to this matter? Or how best to be preceded this? Because I think the figure quoted is quite extortionate for a community. You're gone over your three there, Amit, so yeah. finish up. I'll just finish that point then, Chair. Is there, I suppose, a workaround uh, that we can investigate in terms of providing this at a nominal fee? I'm aware of the issues around 
selling at lower or leasing at a lower value. But I think if there had been a sitting minister, that would be something that wouldn't really be a question. So uh, there's a number of questions and a number of proposals there, Chair, and I appreciate you letting me in. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Officer John Nees. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, so just in, in terms of the, I think, where there were questions, I mean, the, I've noted the, the uh, members' comments in terms of uh, correspondence to O2 around signal coverage in uh, Culmore, Lanny, and Brookmount, and then also the the issue about five G masts within the the council. Uh, if I'll move on to the other points that I can cover off and we'll come back to Oma, Oma Leisure's uh, Cafe, uh, Leisure Centre Cafe, SGN. Uh, there has been protracted engagement uh, around uh, seeking to identify independent verification. We had, all, as part of that process, officers had contacted the SGN. Uh, SGN had provided the correspondence that's attached to it within this, uh, but as part of that uh, uh, discovery, as part of that investigation process, what we've also established is that for council to seek independent verification and to commission an independent uh, report is likely to cost council somewhere in the region of about £15,000, and we wouldn't have uh, financial uh, cover uh, for that, in, certainly within our budgets in, in this year. Uh, Hence, uh, what we've reported back at this stage is the information that's available to officers. Uh, just to reassure the member, no confusion in terms of what the, the recommendation had been from the, the previous meeting. Uh, but equally, uh, we, said we don't have uh, the, the budget to actually uh, move ahead at this stage and commission it. We were asked to go back and investigate it. Uh, so that's, that's what we have done at this stage. Uh, Member, the, I suppose there was a second question that is, you know, could members uh, refuse to approve this application? And yes, that is a decision for. Uh, for members for council. Uh, noted also uh, the uh, the comment about uh, seeking an informal meeting uh, within the West uh, Rail. And I suppose the final uh, point then was around 3.1. Can council proceed without ministerial approval? And uh, so the, the short answer to that would be uh, no, uh, we can't uh, proceed without ministerial approval. The uh, Local Government Act, Northern Ireland 1972, requires that uh, ministerial approval is granted from the ministry, which in this case is the Department for Communities. And the department have advised, as I've uh, said uh, in, in the report, that there is no uh, alternative uh, provision in place at this point in time. Uh, sorry, and I'll just uh, John, maybe come back on the uh, Oma Leisure Centre. Yes, Chair. Thank you, um, Chair. The, ca the cafe has been closed since the, the commencement of, of COVID, and, and the staff who were employed in the cafe have either been redeployed within vacant posts, within budgeted vacant posts within uh, the council here, or who have found alternative employment. So at this point in time, we we have no staff vacancies uh, in in relation for the for Oma Leisure Complex, or for the cafe. Um, as well, it, it was and it was it it has been discussed with members uh, about the the financial efficiencies. We have ninety nine and a half thousand pounds in our budget uh, in relation to uh, Oma Leisure Centre Cafe. Uh, that would be, I suppose, as part of our financial savings uh, for the next financial year, would be uh, would help uh, to meet us meet those financial savings, um, and and uh, we would not be incurring uh, that that cost if if we go ahead with the with the leasing out of of the cafe uh, on on the basis of of the two year process as as is indicated in the report. Thank you, John and John, for those updates. Next, we go to Councillor Podrick and Kelly on WebEx. Thanks, Chair. Um, again, I'm just coming in on the point about the lands on the Ballybrack Road. Um, I think it's a substantial amount of money, considering the need and the community effort that they're willing to put into this. Um, the Friends of Lot McCrory Group and the people of Lot McCrory have upkept this area um, that the Council own for years and I think we should actually put a, I propose that we put a pause on this. Um, it's just disappointing that we'd need Minister approval and again the DUP boycotting uh, the executive. So I propose that we go back to Friends of Lott and see would they support a deferral on this. Um, just think that it's too much money in this time for community groups and they don't have it. I'm going to bring uh, Officer John News in on this again. Sure. I suppose I just 
for, and this may be just to clarify, because I'm not sure whether, the, there, is, there is no proposal from the last meeting nor from the update in, in Fleet Point 1 that Council would seek to execute a lease at 4,600. I think the, the, the Council's intention would, would be to write and seek a nominal uh, below market value uh, uh, from, through the Department for Communities. Uh, so I think the next step would be that we would write to DFC, but it's just that, that the agreement to actually dispose below mark, best market value would, is unlikely to be achieved until such time as there's a minister in place or there's a, a, a delegation of powers to a permanent secretary to take that decision. So uh, it's maybe just to, to clarify that it's not that there's a recommendation from officers that we should seek to execute a lease at 4,600. 4,600 is the assessed uh, market value from LPS. Thank you, John. Next, we go to Councillor Paul Blake on WebEx. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for letting me in. It's regarding issue 2.1, uh, Lisnaric, the leasing of lands to Lisnaric Football Club. Um, I remember myself on the previous mandate of the Council, myself and the other Enniskillen councillors met with uh, Lisnaric Football Club. They were a wonderfully progressive, proactive club. And to see this to come to this point now is, is is wonderful to see. Could actually request because there's something I think the club would be keen on is that council officers work with the club, establish good links with the club, and work with the club to help them source funding to build the fence around the path. Because I think there, as a football club, they'd be very concerned regarding dogs that could be encroaching onto the pitch. So that's something that if the council would permit would be to work with the club to help them source the funding to put that fence in place to secure the playing fields would be that one and also another when it comes to another wonderful organization is the locker and landscape partnership and their display down at the round o also will be great to see so a tribute to the work that they do which is extremely beneficial for the area thanks okay, Thank you, Paul. And Officer John Boyle is indicating that that's acceptable, so we'll see if bringing him in. And finally, on WebEx, I'm going to bring in Councillor Donald Coffey, or sorry, Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald, then it's Councillor Donald Coffey, and then Councillor Diana Armstrong in the chamber. So, Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald. Yes, thanks a lot, Chair. Just um, there's a lot on this report this evening and some good news. Um, I'm just delighted with the Oma Leisure Centre. That has been something that's been raised to me numerous, numerous times about. Um, the, the cafe not opening is a space that was always well utilised and um, for the elder and everybody else and for the users, for the patrons using it and also for the mums and dads who were sort of at a loss where they were written for the children whether they be swimming lessons or anything else there. So whilst it's not going to your own staff and, and you, you did explain that there is no staff there to do it. So I think that the quicker that it's opened, um, the better, the better for all. And um, and the sad that it hasn't been open for quite a while. And then the other thing is the Green Hill Cemetery being used for the Grove Care Park at St. Endes. It's great to see that there's provision, just as Councillor McIntyre had said, for St. And um, they've done a lot for families and a lot of fundraising there um, for um, people who um, due to ill health and different things. So great facility. See the fun fair. Haven't been into it yet, but hope to get it into it possibly next week. So appreciate it, all the hard work the Council's done and with St. Endes going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, bring in Councillor Donald Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, uh, I'm happy to second the proposals from Councillor McAleer. I think they're well made. Um, I I also want to express my uh, uh, dissent or opposition to the idea that we should simply uh, outsource or privatise uh, the provision of uh, a cafe at uh, Omar Leisure Centre. I think that's uh, a very retrograde move. I do question how it is that we appear to be a, imposing a recruitment ban in this council. Um, I, I I know that uh, a lot of burn bins haven't been collected of late, um, and whether that's due to an overtime ban, again, that's formal or informal, I'm not sure, or whether that's due to a failure to recruit. It is undoubted that uh, there are there are concerns in the community around you know brown bins and other bins not being lifted, uh, and it's causing a lot of problems. And it may actually be, if it is being viewed as some form of a, a cost saving, it may be self uh, defeating, because we'll end up with higher waste uh, and and being trapped with the nylas uh, fines. My question really is around the issue of the um, this independent advice around the SGN. 
we we had a, a proposal seconded unanimously adopted by every councillor here uh, that we would seek independent advice. But what we're after hearing is the director has explained that this is has been dispensed with without any vote of our council, simply by dint of the fact that uh, there was an unexpected cost associated. We weren't told at any point that the uh, decision of this council as the executive body was to be dis, uh, dis ditched. Uh, and and we wasn't there was no explanation offered as to why this was or uh, that it wasn't highlighted in any way, and it was only when Councillor McAleer raised it as a, a conflict with what was being act asked of us that uh, we have now become aware that a, a democratically expressed uh, opinion or decision of this council has been uh, unduly uh, just ignored. It seems. And I don't think that that is uh, the way that council is supposed to work. Perhaps the director can better explain how councils work. But I, I know that this has been raised in the past by other councillors where decisions have been basically disregarded over time. And I, I would be very concerned if this was an example of that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ryan, you want to come in on that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> just to reassure members, there was no intention to override uh, the, the recommendations and the actions that were agreed from previous council meetings. What we had been doing was investigating, uh, and the, uh, the independent advice as part of those investigations, as I've uh, explained already, uh, we had contacted the SGN and we had done some uh, scoping work as to what would it cost to prepare independent advice. Uh, if, if, if it has been my omission uh, to uh, include that cost line or what that, in, that, that indicative cost would have been for the independent advice, I'm happy to apologise for that as, a, as an oversight on my part, but uh, we have been investigating that uh, and the, so the decision is still there for Council to either approve the recommendation, uh, but as I said, just to note that at this point in time, uh, given the, the constraints that we have, uh, we wouldn't have budget uh, for that independent advice at this particular juncture. That's not to say that uh, you know we can't take that away and, and look at that. Thank you, John. Next we go to Councillor Diana Armstrong in the Chamber. Chair, just, just coming in to second uh, Councillor Crawford's uh, proposal on the mural. I do think it's good that we do have oversight of what is going up in public art. Um, and I think it's it's important to, to just see that before it goes up. Of course, um, I support the work of LELP on biodiversity. Um, so I just like to second that. And then going to item 2.2, Enniskill and Workhouse, another signature project on the site of the former Iron Hospital. I just wonder, could could we um, submit a request to see around the workhouse when it is opened? I think it'd be very useful in terms of the economic um, potential of that for, for training. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Next, we go to Councillor Robert Irvine. Thank you very much, Chair. It, it's just, I suppose, a response to some of the comments made by some of the councillors. I think if some of the councillors would attend, particularly the estimates uh, meetings in the process, they may uh, become aware of the financial constraints being placed on this council. And I think it's indicative that some people choose not to attend, and they should attend, because we're in a particularly difficult situation. And comments that are thrown about that our executive directors are making um, unnecessary decisions is unwelcome, unhelpful, and ill-informed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Robert. Um, so, not seeing anybody else indicating to speak. So, the first proposal was that of Councillor McElduff and seconded by Councillor Crawford that we adopt the uh, recommendations as put forward by the officer. So, um, there is a little bit of dissent as there is a contrary uh, proposal to that. So, uh, Councillor McAleer and Councillor O'Coffey. Um, is chair, anybody I'm, else opposed? Sorry, chair, Emmett. Sorry, Chair. I was just going to say maybe the the original proposer might consider amending his proposal to or accept all with the update that the we reject the application from SGN given the lack of information available on it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'll go back to Councillor Michael Duff. To be honest, the only concern that I was going to express was I wanted to be sure that Councillor. Podrick and Kelly's point was accommodated, and I think it was, 
by the director, John, you know, in relation to you know, how much uh, the process on down the line in respect of, of Luck McCrory. I just wanted to be assured that uh, Councillor Kelly's concerns were assuaged, you know, so that the community association or the friends of can be uh, accommodated in that area. That was my only reason for coming back in, you know, otherwise, um, if, if Councillor Kelly's concerns are assuaged uh, in the proposal, then I'm content to put the proposal. Yeah, I, I believe they are. I think the, the general consensus is that we do want to work as a council. We want to work with the Lock Macquarie community, but we have to stick within the legislation as it currently is. It's what I'm gathering from the officers. Is that right? Yes, Chair. The, the original recommendation, as, uh, as presented previously, had been that we would write uh, DFC seeking the, uh, the seeking to, sorry the minister I should say seeking a nominal uh, rental below market value uh, rent uh, lease income. Uh, what was noted previously was that it was unlikely that that would be approved given the current situation uh, in Stormont. Uh, but that's not to say that we can't write, and it then goes into a queue within DFC. Uh, at such time as a as a decision can be made, and it may be that there there may be some change or some additional powers that are delegated to permanent secretary. At the minute, we have no indication of that. Okay, thank you, John. As so, uh, so there is dissent, and to see if any back and forward, we're just going to go for a vote. Uh, and that's vote, on, please, chair. Yeah, that can be done. It will be, uh, and if that that goes through, then the the, next, the following. Uh, Proposals will fall. So, if we could set that up, please. That's to go with the officer's recommendations as listed. Okay, so uh, that's twenty-five four two against. So uh, that uh, those proposals are going to be adopted. Uh, Councillor McAleer's proposal seconded by Councillor Coffey falls, and the other proposal we have is Councillor Crawford seconded by Councillor Armstrong that we get to see the uh, the images before they are actually put up at the round O. Is there anybody contrary to that? No. So that's adopted as well. Next, we go on to item. But uh, six point two, which is sorry. Next, we go on to item six point two, which is uh, the director's chair, report. Sorry. Just for clarification, there, chair. I'd made a number of proposals there, including inviting in the into the West campaign group. I'm presuming there. All accepted on opposed. It's just the the safety of the gas network beside the primary school that councillors have the opposition to. Uh, no, the, they don't have opposition to safety. They're accepting the safety that's been proposed. So it's by the me. gas company chair. I think not. It's by just your company. opinion, councillor McAleer. But yes, it's the it's other matter is still stand. Fact, chair. Sorry, so I didn't realise you're a gas expert, Councillor McAleer, and we will not be taking opinion from the you. Chair, I'm not. That's the exact point that I was raising. 
but obviously there's... Councillor McAleer, the matter right? has been passed. We are Here. finished on this topic. Well, that's an absolute disgrace, Chair. It's, Councillor McAleer, if you do not stop, I'm going to ask you to be removed from the meeting. We're finished on this matter. Okay, sorry. So the, the informal proposal by Councillor McAleer, seconded, seconded by Councillor O'Coffey, that we have an informal meeting with the Into the West group. Is there anybody opposed to that? No, so that is adopted as well. Thank you. Next, we go on to item 6.2, which is John News, Director's Report. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. A uh, number of items in, in this, uh, two for information and one for decision. Uh, the first uh, item for information is just household bin collection arrangements over the festive period and uh, just presented for information in terms of uh, household bin collections operate normal on uh, Tuesday 27th to the th uh, 30th of December. No uh, collections on Monday the 26th and bins will be collected instead on the 31st of December and then operate again uh, from normal on the, the 2nd of January 2023. Uh, information also to note around successful funding application on the, the Marine Litter Grant and uh, Council has secured uh, £12,025 of funding uh, to install, uh, purchase, install and pilot uh, eco water refill stations at four sites across the district, a solar compactor bin and four litter picking stations uh, at the uh, various locations as noted uh, throughout the district. Uh, the uh, 2.3 within the, the paper is uh, for decision. Uh, this is an update on uh, the recent uh, pre-inquiry, uh, pre pre-public inquiry meeting that was held in the Strew Arts Centre uh, by the, the PAC on the 15th of November. Uh, just provides a, a short update. I uh, know some members were at that, at that meeting. But a short update on the meeting that took place uh, facilitated by uh, PAC with representatives from Department for Infrastructure, uh, the anti-A5 legal team and landowners and other families that have been impacted by uh, road traffic collisions along the A5 and uh, council officers were also in attendance at that. Uh, at, uh, as a result of that meeting or subsequent to that meeting, the PAC have also uh, written to us in the copy of correspondence attached to the Appendix 2 advising that the timeline for the, the public inquiry, which was due to restart in February, has now been uh, rescheduled and postponed to a later date, and they will write to us advising of, uh, uh, of the, the new date in due course. Also included within the, uh, the paper, and this is for the decision, is uh, a council, uh, a draft response to the consultation on the uh, environmental statement addendum that has been updated following the consultation earlier this year. Uh, members will recall that Council had made uh, submissions uh, to that uh, consultation process earlier in the year. Subsequent to that, uh, officers have now had a further meeting with the environmental advisors uh, working for or with DFI uh, roads on the scheme and uh, have addressed all of the points that we were previously raised and that's noted within our uh, proposed response to this subsequent uh, consultation on the supplementary inf information that was published in, uh, uh, on, at, at the start of November. Uh, and uh, the closing date for those responses is the, the 23rd of December, hence the, the presentation to uh, members here tonight for approval. Uh, so the draft response is attached in Appendix 1. Uh, and uh, again, we've used this opportunity uh, within the response to reiterate the Council's uh, commitment to uh, an early resumption of the uh, PAC public inquiry and uh, enabling the Department to progress the scheme at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you, John. Obviously, items 1 and 2 are to note, as they're for information, and item 3 is as, as John has explained. So, first of all, I'm going to Councillor Emmett McAleer on Webex. Thank you, Chair. I suppose I wasn't expecting to be first in there, but um, no, in relation to uh, page one and the, the issue on the household bin collection arrangements, and again, this was touched on by Councillor Coffey, and I have raised it with uh, the director in recent weeks, um, that there has been a number of complaints um, from residents across the district about non-collection of brown food caddies. And I suppose what I would like to do at this meeting is get some assurances that normal service has been resumed in terms of the collection of the brown and food caddies along all roads. Um, I did note a comment on social media 
that suggests that residents play a game of Fermanagh Noma District Council missed bin collection bingo. Um, I, and my concern here is that rural residents who are already disadvantaged because they have the 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 caddies, they don't have the large two hundred and forty liter wheelie bins, are being further disadvantaged from their urban counterparts when this fortnightly service is being missed. And uh, I really, my question or or I wonder is. How can we as a council work towards ensuring that this does not develop to be a further continuing repetitive problem? Um, I note, and I'm sure other councillors note, the weekly lists and posts on social media of the different roads and areas that this is affecting right across our district, and obviously the inevitable posts and questions that follow. Uh, I'm going to stop you there, Emmett, because I believe that part of this is going to be covered under confidential matters. That's so, right. Well, if you want to leave it there. Well, if we could get any response in, in open, or even if we get a commitment to a response, that would be great, Chair. But then in relation to the the second, the appendix attached in relation to Council's response to the A5 uh, questionnaire, there from an environmental point of view, there are a number of very questionable elements to that. I would suggest the the use of uh, removing peat. Uh, is, is something that I would have serious reservations and serious concerns on. And and probably more, even more pressing than that is the, the delay, the delay to this project that I think the vast majority of this district and this council area do want to see progress. But the delay as illustrated and quite clearly illustrated in the letter from the PAC is solely down to failings by DFA. And that's really quite shocking, given the tens of millions of pounds that they have wasted on this project to date. So I suppose the call going out from this council, as well as progressing this with the legal diligence and the environmental diligence that the project should have been run with from the very start, is getting DFA to get their act together to provide the information they're legally obliged to and to do so without any further delay. Thank you, Chair. On that one, uh, sure. I mean, I, 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 within the draft response, I mean, we can certainly strengthen the the comments in terms of the the delays. Uh, and the, the member is right that the the public inquiry resuming has been uh, delayed, as PAC have outlined in their correspondence, as a result of the say the the, the confluence of the, the the timelines with the the DFI. Uh, Supplementary information consultation only closing on the the twenty third of December, and then the anticipated resumption of the public inquiry in January, and uh, an opportunity for uh, everybody concerned in the public inquiry to be able to consider the information that was going to the, come out from DFI as a result of this latest consultation. So, I think it is it, it is a reasonable observation that, that the, the public inquiry has been delayed as a result of those timelines, uh, and I think that what we can certainly strengthen the the or comment in this consultation feedback around encouraging the department uh, DFI uh, to progress at, at the earliest opportunity when the public inquiry has concluded its uh, deliberations. Thank you, John. Next, we have Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just on the uh, litter picking stations there, if uh, John could give me a little bit more information as to uh, when uh, they are likely to be installed, and two, as to why Bungetti, uh of all places should be picked in Newton Butler as a as a venue for a litter picking. And then my third uh, question, Chair, is we had uh, back last year, or even a little further back, talked about the uh, investigation of the return um, Coke cans, bottles, that sort of thing, machine, and trying to get some into the council area. And I'm just wondering, uh, have we any update? Thank you, John. 
<coughs> sorry, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, in terms of the, the when the, the letter packing stations, uh, the funding is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is, is year incentive. So we will be installing uh, these uh, during the current financial year and be able to have those in, in place as, as soon as possible. I believe that will be uh, before the 31st of March. I can't give at this stage a, a more uh, precise date. So it'll be in, in, in early in the new year. Uh, in terms of uh, why uh, Bungetti, Bungetti isn't actually for a litter picking uh, station. Bungetti was the uh, uh, Bungetti was identified as the location for the, the solar compactor bin on a pilot basis, and, and I think that reflects the, the location and the, just the work. It's seen as certainly a, as an efficiency pilot in terms of the frequency with which then the bin otherwise would have to be uh, visited and emptied. Uh, so it's something that we're looking to, to pilot through this this funding in the first instance. Sorry, I, I think I may, if there was a, a councillor or uh, the member had an, an, another point at the end. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, if members, I, I don't have, the, I just don't have that information to hand at the minute. But if members content around the uh, deposit return scheme is something that is being developed further with DRM and with DEFRA, uh, and there will be more information coming out on that in the in, during the, in the new year 2023. Uh, but I'm happy to come back either with a further report on that to uh, a future environment services if that was connect rather than. Uh, or I can come back to the members separately offline, whichever you prefer. Say a report in the a director's, uh, or a report in the director's paper in, in the future, if you're content. Yeah, that's uh, grand. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thomas, would you mind uh, uh, proposing that we note the updates and uh, the approve the draft response as with the amendments as suggested? With the amendments as suggested, happy to propose, Chair. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Next, we go to Councillor Paul Blake on Webex. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, I was just trying to get myself logged in there. It was regarding 2.2 also, following up with what Councillor O'Reilly said. Uh, very supportive and very much welcome this funding and request that if there was any future funding was to come in that we could uh, look at the possibility of rolling this out across our town centres, especially with regard to the water dispensers. I think it's something that we need to be encouraging going forward is to reduce the use of plastics and encouraging everyone to have refillable water bottles. So if if that could be considered when further funding, if further funding was to become available and also welcome uh, what Councillor O'Reilly said regarding uh, a way of dealing with cans. Um, so I look forward to hearing the report from that from John, thank you. Are you going to second, Paul? I'll happy to second. John, thank okay. you. Thank you. Next, we go to Councillor uh, Donald O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. A um, few questions, really. Uh, the the uh, I think the idea of uh, these uh, eco water refill stations are very positive. I think the the question, really, to my mind, is that if we're uh, the solar compactor bin and and various other accoutrements. How do these uh, likes? I know Councillor Curry, when she was here, she would often raised the issue of um, leave no trace as a policy, which I believe is our policy. So I'm wondering how is this coherent with that policy? Um, the second thing is in relation to the A5, I would just have to say I, I definitely share the concerns raised by Councillor McAleer there around uh, the idea of lifting bog if, you know, if, if it's in the wrong place, uh, you know, and at, at this time when bogland is of such importance in terms of carbon fixing, and not only that, but our wider, uh, our wider environmental protection, it's it's uh, quite shocking that we're seeing this sort of proposal coming forward. But um, the other question, obviously, is around the first issue, which is around the has been raised by Councillor McAleer as well, uh, the the bin arrangements. Um, can I just clarify, because I, I, I think Councillor McAleer was looking for some form of report for the public, because obviously people are asking all the councillors, I'm sure, about the arrangements um, around bins and why bins aren't being lifted. Is there like is there a policy decision? Has there one, one been taken in regard to overtime and not filling empty uh, posts, uh, which posts that come empty? Is that what's driving the failure to lift these brown bins? And if so, does that have any implications for our statutory role as a function uh, function as a council uh, to 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 collect bins? Um, so, just those questions. Thank you, Chair. 
again, I'll point out that we will be discussing this later on, but I'm going to pass you over to Officer John News. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just in terms of the uh, the environmental sustainability uh, pilots that uh, we've been able to receive funding for, I think they do align with our uh, the, the Council's position around Leave No Trace. Uh, the, these uh, these uh, Installations will also provide opportunities for further messaging around leave no trace. Uh, but just because we're encouraging people to leave no trace, we know that there's still a requirement for us to provide bins and to collect litter across the district. Uh, and uh, you know what we what we know generally is that this is very much about behaviour change and about a consistent, clear, and simple message to people. Uh, so we are encouraging people. To, you, know, you can see from one of the uh, the graphics, it's about yes, reduce, reuse, and recycle. But in in respect of say the water stations. It's about refilling. Uh, so if somebody has a, a reusable uh, plastic bottle or a reusable metal bottle, that they can refill that in these stations rather than have to go for uh, single-use plastic. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, similarly, then uh, the the community engagement piece involving people uh, is is recognised as as a very effective way of changing behaviours rather than simply telling people. So the litter the litter pick stations uh, provide uh, very valuable opportunities and have been very well received for they've been piloted elsewhere across the district and uh, certainly our hope would be that uh, they'll be similarly successful in the uh, the other sites that we're identifying through this uh, uh, project funding. Uh, so, uh, specifically then coming back to the, the point around bin arrangements, our bin arrangements uh, continue to operate uh, within the resources that are available to us. Uh, as we've posted on social media, uh, any changes uh, have been uh, on particular routes on particular days and that reflects operational uh, pressures. Uh, there has not been a, a policy decision in, in respect of our bin collection services. Our services are operating in line with the, the budgets that have been uh, agreed and approved by Council in October uh, 2022. Uh, and I suppose uh, that's, we, we do continue to discharge our statutory function. The statutory function is about providing the waste uh, collection service. Uh, the, the, that, that doesn't uh, determine or dictate how a council provides that service. Uh, and I say we do have a responsibility to, to operate within the available budgets and resources uh, to us, but there has been no policy change in that regard. These are operational decisions that have been taken over uh, the, uh, recent uh, weeks and uh, last, I think it's the last eight weeks at this point. Thank you, John. Next, we go to Councillor Barney McElduff. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I never looked at the response to the A5 consultation. Um, I kind of was looking for urgency and to ensure that the, the different imperatives are in there. And in paragraph seven, I think it deals mostly with that. Um, it talks about economic benefits, better connectivity and improved road safety. If there was to be one additional point added in after better connectivity, it might be reduced travel times. It's just another of the imperatives in association with the A5 project. And of course, road safety, if that wasn't there, we would be uncertain that that's there. And uh, basically those imperatives. So I'm looking for imperatives and I'm looking for urgency, our total commitment, you know, our total support, and just the additional uh, element of reduced travel times. I know it's a cousin of connectivity, but it might be a good idea to, to put it in specifically. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go briefly. Councillor O'Reilly, are you happy with that? And Councillor Blake, I'm assuming you are, but just give me a... There's a thumbs up from one. Yeah, I'm going to assume that Councillor O'Reilly is agreeable to that change as well. I think it's within the uh, bounds. So uh, I'm I not in here. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Uh, so I'm assuming uh, we're all in agreement then on uh, any dissent. So we go with, note the uh, the information and we uh, approve the uh, the return for the uh, just for couple <laughs> consultation. Thank you very much. Next, I'm going to now ask, can somebody propose that we go into confidence? Chair. Sure. Sorry, uh, Councillor Earl Thompson. Yeah, just before you move on from that, uh, I suppose with regard to the A5 Western Transport Corridor and all that's involved there, I think uh, it's very important that the landowners 
are very much engaged with as we move forward on this occasion. I just, I'll just leave that comment there. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Donald, you've already been in on this topic. Sorry, it was just to express my dissent in that part. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm going to ask for somebody now to propose, Councillor Victor Warrington, and gonna, uh, Councillor Robert Irving seconding going into confidential. So if we could set that up, please.
Thank you. And now we go to Officer uh, John News for an update on the proceedings during confidential matters. During uh, confidential uh, business, uh, members uh, heard an update on, uh, on a, a report on strategic waste management arrangements in Northern Ireland and also uh, uh, decisions in respect of some confidential estate matters and an update on uh, waste management services uh, within the district. Uh, and, uh, no matters arising from the previous confidential minutes. Thank you. Can I have a proposal and second to note? Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Stevenson, I think, got in there first. Okay, so we're going to agenda item 7.1, and again, this is uh, for information, and it is a uh, building control and licensing report, and we go to Officer John Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is the standard monthly report for building control and licensing, and, and uh, the recommendation is that the Council notes the report on building control and licensing actions for the period 19th of October to the 15th of November. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Proposed by Councillor Paul Robinson, seconded by Councillor Garbrand Phillips. Anybody contrary? No, thank you. Next, we go on to item 7.2, which is the determination of fees for entertainment licences. And this is uh, an update on, on what we'd previously been advised by the uh, central government. I've just forgot what the department was called. Yes, yes. I'll leave that to Officer John Boyd. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. You will see in Appendix 1 of the report the uh, correspondence from the Department for Communities uh, in relation to the fees for entertainment licences. Members will be aware that during the COVID period for two years, uh, the fees were set at a £1 nominal fee. Uh, and uh, you will see from the correspondence that now that we are have uh, came out of COVID, that uh, the Department of Communities have informed us that they will revert to the pre-COVID levels. Um, so the recommendation is the council notes the entertainment license fees will revert to the pre-April 21 levels, effective from the 6th of April 2023, as di directed by the Department for Communities. And again, I'm looking at proposer, Councillor Paul Stevenson, and a seconder, uh, Councillor Roy Crawford. Okay, so that's proposed and seconded. Anybody contrary? No, thank you. So finally, we go on to agenda item 8.1, which is the report on Northern Ireland Local Authority Collected Municipal Waste Management, Quarter 1, and we go to Officer John News. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a, a regular uh, report uh, to members. It's an update on collected municipal waste management statistics for Quarter 1 of uh, the April to June 2022. Uh, it's a, an update on our uh, performance in terms of waste arisings, recycling, energy recovery and landfill. Uh, and it also provides some uh, comparative data uh, with uh, other councils in Northern Ireland and at, at a Northern Ireland level. It's presented uh, for information. Okay, so go to Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. I was hoping to get comment on a previous item, but unfortunately it was skipped on there. Um, maybe the, the hands in the, the chamber might have got there before us, but in terms of this particular report, I, like they, these reports that come out, I continue to find them quite concerning. I suppose the the note on the, the report in front of us, 2.2.2, talks about recycling. We were the only council area to see a drop in recycling figures. 2.2.4 in landfill, the largest increase was recorded in Fermanagh and Oma of 13.4 percentage points. Um, the lowest recorded in our neighbouring site, Mid Ulster, at 3.1%. Um, on page four of the report, 2.2.6, in Fermanagh and Oma, 57.6% of all waste sent to landfill was biodegradable. Again, to my mind, that would underline the necessity of providing uh, the larger brown bins for all residents. But I've made this proposal before, and, and maybe it's worth making it again that when we see the figures, for our own council area and our the I suppose looking on enviously maybe at the, the figures of neighbouring council areas or areas of a, a similar district size. What benefit would it be or can we let what learning can we take on board from the likes of Mid Ulster District Council in terms of looking at the figures that they're currently showing and the figures that we're currently showing and trying to achieve or or better the performance of our own uh, council area in terms of some of these figures. So uh, I, I'll maybe make that as a as a proposal in the hope that 
with collaboration because obviously these these figures that are presented in the report it's not a competition one trying to outdo the other it's a collaborative piece of work so maybe by by working collaboratively collaboratively with some of the other district councils and borough councils we can try and improve and, and do better going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do you want to come in there, John? Yeah, Chair, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll make a, just a couple of uh, observations and then I'll maybe ask Sinead if, if there's anything that she wants to add uh, to us. So, uh, Sinead McAvoy, uh, Head of Waste. Uh, as in terms of the, the figures, yes, the, the figures are, it's worth stating and it's not to uh, down for these are provisional figures. Uh, they they will be subject to uh, validation at the end of the year, uh, but they are also uh, a snapshot at a point in time. Uh, the, the the report and the 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 DER report, the NILAS report references the, the the time series data that's available, and uh, what members will see from that time series data is that there is a cyclical pattern uh, to the nature of these figures, uh, and and that is reflected going back over the course of the last ten and fourteen years. That's that's not said as a reason that we 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 do appreciate that we need to do things differently, that we need to double down, and particularly when it comes to recycling, that we need to have uh, much stronger, clearer, consi consistent and simple messaging around uh, what's required when it comes to, to recycling, uh, whether that's about reducing consumption, whether it's around opportunities for reuse. And we have a number of schemes that are, are, are active uh, within the district, such as the paint reuse scheme that's now restarted, or the uh, the, the furniture uh, recycle, a reuse scheme that, that's also, that had been suspended during COVID, but is now getting restarted. So we do appreciate that we've been coming out of a, a difficult time over the last couple of years, we do need to double down. There's more that we need to do. The uh, the landfill uh, figure, I suppose, I also have to just put that into the context of that we are one of the, the councils with a, an active landfill site, and we've already referenced our plans uh, that Drami as, as a landfill site will close in mid-2024. Uh, but those figures around landfill reflect the asset base that we as a council currently have, and we're actively working towards a, a closure plan for Drami and all of the other uh, critical investment or infrastructure investment investments are part of that. Uh, the members uh, mentioned and, uh, about uh, the opportunities to, to learn from uh, collaboratively and work collaboratively. And from the, the last time this report uh, came, uh, we have been in contact and, uh, with, with other councils for the council waste forum uh, on a one-to-one on -one basis with individual councils as well, and in particular with Mid-Ulster. And actually, we have officers going out to look at some of the uh, alternative provisions and uh, systems that are in place within that council area uh, over the, the course of the next number of weeks. So we, we do hear the, uh, the messages around collaboration and, and learning from best practice, uh, and we are actioning that uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, but I'm not sure, Sinead, if there's anything specific that you want to add. Um, nothing else really specific. I suppose one of the things I wanted just to focus in um, was about just the landfill. Um, and I suppose the point that John has made about taking quarters in isolation, um, I think it's important, particularly in relation to landfill, to look at um, the information over the course of the year. Um, and if I take um, an example where we would have had maybe an operational issue with our compactor at the landfill um, in that same quarter in 2021, um, so you'd have maybe seen um, more RDF in that particular quarter, whereas this year you'll have seen more landfill. Um, so over the course of the year, then those figures will actually, I suppose, even themselves out. So what you will see then in January is we'll be bringing a report um, on the, the yearly annual figures um, for the previous year. The other thing I suppose that we've talked about tonight um, is the work that we're doing in relation to our waste transformation project. Um, and we've been working closely with RAP. Um, as part of that, um, who have been funded by DERA to help us um, to look at, I suppose, some of the options um, that we might look at as to how we continue to deliver um, all of our waste services. Um, so that's something that we, we will engage further with members on in the new year um, by way of a paper um, and, they also, and then also follow with a workshop. So thank you. Thank you, Sinead, and thank you, John. Uh, Emmett, I'm just going to come back to you briefly. John has indicated that the, the staff are already working do you want to leave your set aside your proposal that they're already doing it and, and await an officer report to come forward? I have been off as I noted in my comments. I thought it was one that I had made previously, so I was glad to hear there's an update on that. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, John, for that feedback. Okay, thank you. And next, we go to Councillor O'Coffey on Webex. 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. I was I was going to come in to second that proposal, but being that's already happening, um, I'm happy to leave that go. But I, I just think the the figures on page five there, um, we are the second worst in terms of the last quarter, and this was this year, not the previous year, in terms of uh, reuse, dry recycling, and composting. And it's not just that we're the second worst. The the worst is Belfast, and the worst is always going to be Belfast because of the nature of a a city environment <clears throat> and the difficulties associated with collecting uh recycling uh, in a city where people live in uh, tower blocks high rises closed uh, gated communities and the like it's quite a difficult um, operating environment for anyone collecting waste as we, we can imagine but if you take belfast out of it we are the worst council uh and that's quite something because we're, that's behind Derry city in straban which is the the next up so we really have to say, uh, I just reinforce what uh, Councillor McAleer saying there, what is Andrew Minute and Abbey's doing right and what is, um, you know, Mid-Ulster uh, and, you know, Armagh, Bambridge, Craig Avon. We definitely have to look uh, at what, what, how are they uh, actively promoting recycling in a way that we are not effectively. Now, the, the intimation, from what I understand from what the Director News had said there, is perhaps that there is... Uh, heavier emphasis in landfill being that we're moving to a closure situation but does that mean that we're actually sending stuff to landfill to meet a, a wider deadline that should be recycled um and that is that would be a bit concerning if so but i i definitely think we need to see how we can uh, address this this is something we can do a lot better than we're doing on on it and uh, unfortunately what we've just heard in the closed session there would make this uh, likely to be even worse in the future so um, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Next, we go to Councillor Paul Robinson in the Chamber. Did you notice? Thank you, Paul. Have we a seconder for that? Councillor Diana Armstrong. Uh, okay, so that's proposed to note uh, uh, agenda item 8.1. So, anybody contrary to that? Oh, right, so we'll go forward. Next, we go on to correspondence, and we have uh, three items of correspondence. And the first is our pothole fixing machine. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, at uh, October meeting, uh, members have asked that we'd write, uh, seek further information, seek clarification from DFI Roads as to the criteria that they'd used in assessing the performance of the JCB Pothole Pro uh, against their existing uh, repair methods and machinery. Uh, so we've had a response back from a uh, uh, divisional uh, roads manager setting out the uh, five criteria, which include uh, cost, sufficiency, suitability of the equipment, the required operator expertise, and health and safety considerations. Uh, so the uh, correspondence is uh, there to note. Thank you, John. I'm assuming Bernice wants to come in on this. Yes, she does. Yeah, ahead, thank you very Smith. much. Thank you very much, Garagat. Here, look, I hate to be predictable, but anyway, uh, such as it is, and you know, yes, while the question I had raised was, you know, against, you know, what's the criteria, and certainly, okay, the five points answer that, but really, I was hoping for a much more expansion on that. You know, quite simply, I would really just be asking if Daniel could clearly state exactly why not. Uh, on all of the bullet points on the left hand side, could he not merely state against that on the right hand side why such an outcome of an assessment uh, cannot happen? And that would enable me and other councillors to make sense of his correspondence or indeed why the suggestion of the pothole fixed in, fixing machine is not consider, considered viable. And indeed, the fact that we see it clearly working in the UK and the ROI, the example that I gave in the first place when I first raised this a few months ago, and um, again with all the issues outlined, it really was over to the department to prove once and for all why this machine is not viable. I don't accept that this response is good enough and um, it's more of a brush off uh, really i would have just liked a little bit more detail to help understand it does again just like many other departmental correspondences it raises more questions than provides answers to me so which in this instance is not convincing me anymore 
and it's really more highlighting that this is a machine to be invested in by the department and it's just reluctance on their part more likely because of budgetary constraints we all know too well what that's all about but um you know for that criteria as well where they state about needing operatives to be trained to use this machine look i'm sure it doesn't take astronauts to operate that machine you know um so i don't even accept that uh, i know there are plenty of personnel within dfi who have the wit and wherewithal uh, to operate such machinery so look in a nutshell i would ask again please that if daniel could respond by simply saying you know categorically uh, of the five bullet points outlined what exactly the whys and uh, what ifs um, um just totally once and for all because as another councillor had suggested a way back um you know maybe we could look at this now we cannot because the tight constraints that we have in our budgets and again i don't feel that the council should be taking on the responsibilities of central government departments we've been doing that for far too long and i think it's been said clearly here all night by all other members you know it is yeah. over to Stormont to get up well, and work. Bring you to an end, end there, Bernice. Yeah, just to invest in all of this. So uh, please write back. That's my proposal. Just clearly stating exactly against the five bullet points. Why? OK, thank you, thank you Bernice. Councillor Matthew Bell, make it quick, Matthew. Uh, are we taking all the correspondence on 9.1 together? Uh, 9.1 is that particular item. There's items at 9.2 and 9.3, and I'm going to bring them together. That's all right, I'll be clear with them. So it's it's not that. So next to go to Councillor Barry McIlduff. I want to second uh, Councillor Swift's proposal and just to express the hope too that DFA roads are not becoming increasingly distant. You know, for example, in the case of OMA, for example, section engineer has moved on, new section engineer, uh, very hard to contact, uh, not willing to share mobile number, the same as the previous one did, all that kind of stuff. I hope DFA roads are not disappearing on us in terms of accountability. They don't take part in those neighbourhood renewal uh, events. They don't take part in the state walkabouts. And uh, who do you contact? We're not we're not DFA roads. Also, where, where are the DEA meetings with DFA roads? Could we instigate those as quickly as possible? The, the agreed mechanism where there will be DEA meetings? Perhaps they're on the schedule? Yeah, I think that's been noted. So you've heard the proposal by Bernice, seconded by Barry, and I'm going to bring in Paul quickly. Thanks for saying. I was talking the other day to Brian Stewart, I happened about, I had him out in the site thing, and uh, I mentioned the pothole to him. He turned around to me, I said, the pothole has been marked now twice. He says, I don't think we'll have the money even to fill it the third time, he says. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other thing too, they clean the water tables along the side of the road into the through the, the table and through the edge of the digger. And they only clean the land for the hedge. And the water runs in, it's yanking into the shuck behind the hedge or not. And there was an accident back the last time of the heavy rain on the Northfield Road. And that was the cause of the accident because the water table wasn't pushed through the hedge. They wouldn't put the shovel out and push the hole on through the hedge and let the water away. And there was an accident. So I don't know what way it's going to fare out the road service there. You're pushing road service now for the responsibility of the UK has been wrecked. Yeah, I think we will leave that on there. Write a letter to them. To, I both write a letter about that there. Tell them to make sure they clean the water table through the hedge or the vanals, whatever they the, call them. Make okay. sure they're clean through the hedge. Anybody cycling that? Yeah, Victor. Be cycling Paul's proposal there. there. Yep. Okay, so we've heard uh, Barry's proposal to and and Bernice's proposal, and then Barry's proposal seconded by Paul, and Paul's proposal seconded by Victor. Any contrary? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, proposal to note the correspondence, and that's Matthew and Paul, so correspondence about the... We have two items of correspondence to do with uh, parking space. We're going to take them uh, together because they're, they're unique to the... the Residents of those dwelling houses. Who's covering that? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm going to Officer John News. Sorry, George, just uh, two items of correspondence from DFI advising of a proposal to designate a disabled persons parking bay at Main Street and Six Mile Cross and at uh, Beach Hill and Enniskillen. Uh, I understand these are in, uh, to facilitate requests from uh, local residents in each instance. Okay, so bring in. note both the pieces of correspondence and on the six mile cross letter can i make a proposal we write back to dfi and uh, support the proposal and um, from my understanding a six mile cross i call it the right hand side of the road i think there isn't a disabled park in there so it makes sense i think this, these ones are particularly unique to residents yeah but yeah you, you take the point that, that there isn't any on the, the right hand side of six mile cross so thank you chair thank you go to councillor roy crawford in the chamber Thank you, Chair. I'd like to second uh, Councillor Bell there. Um, just uh, again, uh, on the um, parking bay at Beach Hill, I welcome that um, for the resident and uh, and glad to see that the DFA has made a positive contribution. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we go to... No, we don't. There's nobody on WebEx. So that's that uh, proposal to note both of those and uh, also a proposal from Councillor Bell to, to write, and that was seconded by Councillor Croft. For a second, uh, disabled parking bay, and that's seconded by Councillor Crawford. Okay, we have one item of any other business, and that's Councillor Victor Warrington. So, do you come in now, Victor, please? Sorry, Victor. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just before I start my one item, uh, can I uh, notify a change in our personnel? Um, Councillor Roy Crawford is taking over from Councillor Alex Bird as our representative, one of our representatives on the Permanent Lakeland Tourism. Just to make that official. Thank you. I, I'm basically coming in again as a, as a DFI issue. Uh, DFI are going to love us tonight. Um, after the the public realm scheme was carried out in the skill here which obviously uh, has had mixed uh, has had mixed responses i'm not going to get into saying it's good or it's not good um but the problem with the with it was that when dfa or when all the work was carried out in the public realm scheme um all the the parking enforcements that was on the street from the start to the end of the public realm scheme became basically null and void. So there is no parking restrictions on the street from start to finish. Um, that includes loading bays and more specifically, and uh, a lot of you in here knows how strongly I feel about disabled spaces. Um, disabled spaces for the likes of myself and for the likes of a lot of people or something that is really, really, really needed. Um, and it really hit home when I arrived here for a meeting um, two weeks ago. Uh, there was two cars parked out in the disabled spaces directly opposite the town hall here. Uh, and it transpired that one of the cars that was parked in it actually belonged to a worker um, who had just parked in the space and went about uh, their job on the day, came out and came back the next day and parked again. Now I found out who the, the worker was, tried to contact them, but unfortunately uh, they, they probably had, had been made aware of my quite uh, focal uh, Facebook post and uh, it was probably a case where uh, she chose to ignore me. Um, it's probably figured out now it was a she, but I'm not going any further. Um, anyway, what I am proposing is basically the problem is um, we really are waiting on DFI, and I don't know if they can um, put the legislation back into place again, where where the the, the red coats and the PSNA can enforce the parking regulations on the street. But at the minute, neither the PSNA or the Red Coats, as they're better known as, can enforce any of the parking regulations on the street. They're basically open for abuse from nine in the morning to six in the evening.
by workers and by whoever uh, decides to park there. So I would be making the proposal that we contact DFA as a matter of urgency um, to try to get the, the, the legislation back into place again where these areas can be placed and placed more rigorously. And just in my closing, I'm going to bring you to an end there, Victor. If you want to get this completed before the just, meeting ends, just in my just in my closing statement, then I would make an appeal um, for everybody to please respect disabled spaces. They're there for a reason, and I would ask everybody to respect them and leave them for the people who need them. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, I need somebody to second that. I can see there's people indicating to speak on online, but. We're not going to get this completed, and, and I want to let Officer John Boyle come in. So I'm taking a seconder here. Keith, is, is that what you're coming in to do, second that? Yes, uh, Chair, I'm more than happy to second that, yes. And I agree with uh, Councillor Warrington. There is a big problem at the minute, and it is mostly down to uh, shop workers parking on the street. It has been raised before, so I look forward to hearing what John has to say about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think Councillor Warrington has, has expressed it very well. Um, the, the public realm scheme, um, the, uh, since, the, since the start of the public realm scheme, uh, it was stopped the enforcement uh, and it needs a legislative change or a change within DFI in order to, to, to bring it back. Uh, I know they have an internal process to go through. I know we, had, we have made representations uh, to them and we have provided all the information to them about five months ago, I believe, in, in order to make it, uh, in order for them to process it. I, I do believe they have an internal process to go through and I think there is also a consultation process that they have to go through. Uh, but but certainly, uh, we, we can certainly write to them uh, to see where they are at in, in, in with regard to the re-establishment of, of the enforcement measures. Okay, thank you, John. I'd like to apologise. I know there was a few other councillors wanted to come in and speak on that, but I'm, I'm, I can't make any more time, and we do have to finish the meeting on time, and there's really only a minute left. So uh, apologies to those who wish to speak, but thank you very much. I think we're going to bring the meeting to a close for the night. Thank you very much, everybody.